Amen. Praise the Lord. If you take your Bibles and turn to the book of Isaiah in chapter number 57. Isaiah in chapter number 57 and um, uh, just dealing with the last portion uh, as we talk about the Daniel Project. And it's been just a couple of weeks since we were on that, but we're back uh, on that for Sunday nights. And then to really just have one part of it, uh, as we talked about, as I looked at Daniel, I, I see uh, these three major things that are components of his life. The first one is purpose. You have to have, pur well, you have to know the purpose of God. You can have all the purpose you want. If it doesn't line up with God, it's not going to do you any good. And uh, to, to know the, the will of God, to do the will of God, and to, to purpose, to be intentional at what we do. And uh, the Bible says Daniel purposed in his heart that he would not. And uh, as Christians, we find ourselves being so reactionary, okay? And we're not supposed to live reactionary. The spirit is not reactionary. The spirit is intentional. And we were talking in Sunday school this morning, and, and uh, Brother Cates made the point that uh, the new man in us does not sin. The new man doesn't sin. It's the old man that sins, okay? So the new man is not going, oops, the new man is knowing the word of God, hearing the word of God, obeying the word of God, and the just shall live by faith. And the spirit does not sin. And so to, to live on purpose means to purpose to live in the spirit and uh, to know God's word and to apply God's word. And so Daniel is a person of purpose. And purpose, when we know God's word and we can live on purpose, purpose transcends circumstances. Okay? Because if we live reactionary, good circumstances, good living. Bad circumstances, bad living. And uh, Daniel was not that way. He, you want to talk about somebody that went into some bad circumstances? It was Daniel. Daniel had his family removed from him. He had his home removed from him. He, he even had his future removed from him. Anything that he, he could hope and, and dream of being there in the nation of Israel was taken from him. And so how did he so quickly... Was he so quickly able to live not only in the will of God, but the Bible says with an excellent spirit? How do you live with an excellent spirit when everything's gone bad, gone wrong? And you might even say it, was, it wasn't even his fault. No doubt he had sinned himself, but it wasn't his fault that the nation of Israel was in sin. It wasn't his fault that uh, Jehoiakim and, and Zechariah the king had gone the other way. But it doesn't matter, listen, it doesn't matter, circumstances come into our life. And so when we live on purpose, when we know God's will and purpose to live out God's word, Daniel could live with an excellent spirit despite being in some of the worst circumstances. And uh, such an excellent spirit that, that the chief of the eunuchs developed a love for him. He said, man, this guy's awesome. You know, even though everything's been taken from him, every reason and every opportunity to complain, instead of using it as time to complain, his first thought was, here I am, what do I do now? Here I am, what do I do now? And what are the first thing they bring into him? They bring in the king's wine and the king's meat. Well, that reactionary spirit, the spirit of complaining goes, well, we might as well just enjoy it. Well, what else are we supposed to do? How else are we supposed to provide for ourselves? He says, no, no, no. I've already purposed that I would not defile myself. And so therefore, the next thing for me to do is act according to my principles, according to my purpose, and uh, tell this gentleman, hey, could we do this instead? Man, you got to do it on purpose. A lot of times I find even the sin that the Lord convicts me of, I go, oh, I don't want to be taken surprised by my sin. You know, what does that say about how sober, vigilant I am against my adversary? I don't want to be surprised by my own sin. I don't want my, my wife, which this has happened, of course, my wife to say, man, your attitude stinks. And me to think, oh, I guess it does. You know, I want, to, I want the, the Holy Spirit to be able to do a work in me, but I want to be able to live on purpose and uh, not be defiled. And so Daniel was a person of purpose. The second thing was Daniel was a person of prayer. And we've talked about uh, all those different aspects of prayer. And to be honest, what we're going to look at tonight is, is in some ways is an overview of those things. 
Okay, we, we talked about the, the practical part of prayer and the passionate part of prayer and the powerful part of prayer. And now we're going to talk about the promises of prayer. There's some promises of prayer that are very important. And some of them, to be honest with you, are, are a little bit repetitious. But guess what the key to learning is? Repetition is the key to learning and, and reviewing those things uh, because they're all connected. And so I just want to read this verse. This verse should, should, I believe, should just be in your heart and should be in your mind. Isaiah 57 and verse number 15. For thus saith the high and lofty one that inhabiteth eternity, whose name is holy, I dwell in a high and holy place with him also that is of a contrite and humble spirit to revive the spirit of the humble and to revive the heart of the contrite ones. This is so important to understand that when we're talking about the promise of prayer, <laughs> excuse me, God hears the humble, okay? God, giveth, God resisteth the proud but giveth grace unto the humble. But when we think about him hearing prayer, okay, it's more than just, um, you know, sometimes we think praying is like standing in line at the DMV. You know, click that number, we wait, and your number comes up. Number 47, okay? And you're up there, and you, okay, this transaction's gonna take place. It could not be more impersonal. It could not be more, whether, whether I'm getting something or I'm giving something, Man, you walk out of there and it's done, and you think, huh, next year I gotta do that again. Okay? That's not what prayer is like. So when he says, he, uh, when, I, when I say that he will hear the humble, to be honest, the whole purpose of prayer, if you don't get anything else out of this whole thing we've been talking about prayer, the whole purpose of prayer is to have and maintain and walk and enjoy a relationship with God. That's the purpose of prayer. The purpose of prayer is not simply receiving from God, though he giveth to us far better than our earthly fathers could ever give. Okay, every good gift coming from above. Okay? And not only that, uh, when, will he also hear those petitions when we pray in, in, a, in an intercessory way for others? Most certainly. Okay, most certainly he hears those things. But the purpose for prayer is the place of dwelling. That's the purpose of prayer, to dwell with the Most High, okay? And so when we think about that, and we think about when Paul writes that, pray without ceasing. And when, when, whenever you read that short little verse, you know the first thing that comes to my mind? Well, that's practically impossible, okay? Because we always attach prayer to uh, requesting, where in reality, prayer is much more has to do with dwelling, abiding than it does requesting. Now, if you're abiding, if you're dwelling, are you going to be able to request? Most certainly. Are you going to be able to uh, make your requests, make them known unto God? Most certainly. Are you going to be able to uh, ask him for those things? But think about this. The Bible says that, uh, that, our, that our prayer sometimes is so difficult that the Holy Spirit will make, uh, will make utterings, for, will, will uh, tell God what we're saying. Even when we our utterings, we don't even know what to say. Now, I'm going to tell you, a lot of times when I go to pray, I don't go, um, uh. When I go to pray, i got something to say, right? Amen. So when do I get into such a time of prayer that I don't even know what words to utter, okay? Well, you could say when the circumstances are so bad, you don't know what to say, and that's true. But think about this, when the dwelling is so good, you don't know what to say. Okay? Prayer is about dwelling. Prayer is not about God dwelling with us. Prayer is about us dwelling with him. Look what it says in the verse, verse number 15. For thus saith the high and lofty one that inhabiteth eternity, whose name is holy, I dwell in a high and lofty place. Now, it's telling you the position of God. He inhabiteth all of eternity. God already dwells with us, friend. There is no place that you can go that God is not there. Psalm, 30, Psalm 39, okay? You can ascend into the heavens and he is there. You can go down into the depths of the sea, thou art there, okay? Even when my thoughts are afar off, thou art there. 
Okay? There, there's no place that God is not dwelling with me. Okay? Prayer is not God coming down to dwell with me. Friend, God inhabiteth eternity. Then specifically, God has a position that is high and holy. It says, I dwell in a high and holy place. In this high and holy place, he says, I dwell with. That means those of us who are of, our, of a humble and contrite spirit coming to God uh, humbly before him, we dwell with him. The Bible does not say in Hebrews, let us therefore boldly allow God to come into our living room. It says, let us therefore go boldly into the throne of grace. Okay? So we are dwelling with him. So the promise of prayer is God will hear dwell with the humble. He'll dwell with the humble. He'll dwell with the contrite. So we have to quickly give a, a definition. What are we talking about humble? You, you ever met the man and he says, hey, I'm the most humble guy I know. All right? Uh, the, the word that is used there for contrite is, is the idea of literally being crushed. To be crushed in, in, in the sense that there is, there is no ability Okay? Literally, Jesus says this, without me, ye can do nothing, right? So the, the whole necessity for the branch abiding in the vine is because the branch understands without the vine, you can do nothing, okay? The branch that believes it can operate and stand and produce on his own doesn't need the vine. Therefore, he will not dwell with the vine. So the, the, the contrary, the, the recognition of who I am before God. That's why I believe in this passage, not only does it speak to the condition of that man needs to be humble and contrite before God, but also to the condition of who God is. He is high and lofty. He is high and holy. Okay. Well, how do I become holy before God? Uh, how do, I'm sorry, how do I become humble before God? Friend, if you've met him, that's not a question. He is high and he is holy. Okay? And so he hears, he dwells with the humble. Now, that alone, that verse alone, uh, coupled with the, the idea that God resisteth the proud, but giveth grace to the humble, that with James chapter 4, cleanse your hands, ye sinners. Okay? Humble yourself, cleanse your hands, ye sinners. Draw nigh unto God, and he will draw nigh unto thee. Okay? And not only that, the Bible says in the book of James, if any man lack wisdom, let him ask of God who giveth to all men liberally and upbraideth not. In other words, God is making himself available to the believer, not just to meet the need, but so that the believer might dwell with him, walk with him, abide with him. And the means by which we share that fellowship Certainly walking in the spirit, but the means by which we share that fellowship is through that time of prayer where we spend time praying uh, to the Lord and, and maintaining an attitude of prayer that allows us to walk in fellowship with him. If, if I were to tell you that, that, that on this earth you could live in such a way and you could pray in such a way that you would not just simply know God, but you would dwell with God, man, what a desire. We should have a desire for that to happen. Amen. We should have a desire. Amen. And that sort, of, that sort of prayer, that sort of, not, not, not that sort of prayer. I'm not talking you say a prayer and, you know, uh, hoopla. Now you dwell with God. No, no, no. It's the prayer of the humble. It's not the fancy prayer. But that relationship with God is what is net was uh, evident in Daniel's life in order for Daniel to be able to have an excellent spirit. Okay, the whole time we've been contemplating this idea was Daniel a great man because uh, he prayed, or did Daniel pray because he was a great man? And I, I truly believe this I believe the day after, or the moment that that uh, uh, declaration was signed that nobody could ask anything of anybody other than the king. That Daniel did not think, oh no, what's going to happen if I pray? I believe his mind was more, oh no, what's going to happen if I don't? Right. 
Okay? Daniel was already living in a very difficult place. How do you survive in Babylon? What support group did Daniel have? Well, he had some friends. Praise the Lord for friends, right? Praise the Lord for those that will stand with you. That's a blessing. But he didn't have much of a support group. You know who his support group was? God. God was his support group. And he, he, he deemed it necessary for survival to pray. So if you were to ask him, hey, if you pray, you're going to get thrown in the lion's den. Daniel's thinking, yeah, but guess what happens if I don't? I, I would rather be consumed by lions than to not have a right relationship with my God. Amen. Now, it, now, the Bible doesn't give us much information, but would you believe that Daniel probably, over his lifetime, was probably great, greatly saddened by the condition of the Jews that live in Babylon? Right. Yes. We, we don't have a lot of people standing up, right? We don't have a lot of people that have a right relationship with God. We have uh, Dan, Dan, um, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego who will not bow. Praise the Lord for those friends. But there are a whole lot of captives there in Babylon. I mean, a lot of captives. Some 55,000 will go back uh, with Ezra and then later with Nehemiah. That's a lot of people. And Daniel, not only does, and I don't think Daniel's looking out at them and going, oh, these people. Okay? I don't, personally don't believe that's Daniel's spirit. I would say he had an excellent spirit. Can you see Daniel going, whoa, can you imagine what happened to me if I didn't pray? I see example after example, after example, after example of Jews that have been swallowed by the Babylonian society, Jews that have forsaken that which they know is right, Jews, even his first week while he's eating uh, this, this vegetable yuck and drinking water, guess what all the other Jews are, are eating? The, the, the best of the king's meat and drinking the king's wine. They, that, from that very first moment, they compromised. Do you think Daniel walked around and say, well, you know, well, I didn't do it because I'm Daniel. <laughs> think about it. Before Daniel was ever Daniel, he was just Daniel. Okay? He was just a guy who needed God. He purposed in his heart. He said, God, I need your help. And every circumstance that came into his life, he said, I need time to pray. I need time to pray. And so the promise of prayer is this is that God will hear, dwell with the humble. He will hear, dwell with the humble. Which means that part of my purpose, part of my desire in my prayer life, and part of my desire in my life, is asking the Lord, continue to ask the Lord, what hinders me from being humble? What stops me uh, would cause division between me and the Lord? And uh, we were talking about this, uh, this morning in Sunday school, right after the idea of surrender. Surrender is not just giving up that which is bad. Surrender is also giving ownership to God of that which is good. Amen. Right? Instead of thinking that we have ownership over those things. Okay, and I was using an example right, right after Sunday school. You know, we often think surrender means uh, I'm, I'm going to not do this, I'm going to not do this. But surrender is also giving up that which is good. What, what if God calls my children, uh, some of my children to be missionaries? On the other side of the world. You think it'd be hard to surrender and give them up? You bet I would, but can I tell you, my will is nothing compared to the will of God. God, you can have them. Okay? As something as serious as that to, uh, there, there may be a television in your house. Well, it's my television. Guess whose television it really is? Yeah, amen. It's God's. Surrender it. Means that he has ownership of it. He can determine what goes on it. Okay. Oh, now you're just getting legalistic. No, not, it's not really le legalism. It means I'm adding something to salvation. You have to do this in order to be saved. I'm just trying to tell you that God wants you to live holy. Okay? And the, my, my reaction to, to what God would want me to live as far as holiness, my reaction against that is always an attitude of pride. Now, let me just clarify. This is my reaction to what God wants me to do to live holy, okay? That's what I'm concerned about. 
To be honest, I'm not concerned about what some man wants me to do to live holy. I'm concerned about what God wants me to do to live holy. Amen. And so surrender, that humility, has less to do with a change in direction. Oh, I guess I'll try to do this, so this might be better. Surrender, humility, reminds us and, and, uh, and returns us to the fact that he is owner. He is authority. He is our God. We've been bought with a price. There is nothing that I have, no place that I go, not even a very thought that I think that are not his in ownership. He purchased them with his blood. Amen. And as soon as I react to that and go, yeah, but that's my thoughts, my life, my, that's an attitude of pride. So we say, oh, Lord, here's the humble. Sweet, I'll just be humble. Welcome to the journey, friend. Okay, and, and so, but, but the blessing is that humility has less to do with this idea of just responding to God right now. Responding to God as he shows you in his word and he leads you on the path, being obedient to the Lord. One of the things that annoys me to no end, you have children, some of you have children. You'll identify with this perhaps. Your kids will be sitting down and they'll be reading a book, okay? Or they'll be playing a game, and you'll say, hey, I need you to get up and go do something. Okay. <laughs> now, in their mind, they're thinking, what's 10 more seconds? In my mind, when I ask them to get up and go do something, you know what I want to see? Movement. I want to see movement. Guess what I want to see a movement? As soon as the words stop coming out of my lips, your body's supposed to start moving. Right? And guess what, I, guess what sense I get when they're like, all right. I'm telling you, as a father, I want to pick them up and throw them out of the window. <laughs> now, I try not to do that. It could be counterproductive. Windows cost a lot of money. <laughs> but I, I want to see movement. You know what spirit I get when I don't see that movement? It's a spirit of pride. And as soon as I get from them that spirit of pride... I'm going to tell you, there is not, the, the fellowship has immediately been affected by it. Right. Though, the, though the activity may be eventually get there, though it may be restored, listen, humility is the ability to hear and respond to God as he is the one that has the right to determine what I think, act, do, and go. And he hears the humble. He dwells with the humble. Praise the Lord, what a promise that God will hear. Hey, well, I'm, I'm, I'm too bad to be humble. The fact that you're so bad should be the first step towards humility. Right? right? I remember as a kid going out and uh, you know, playing basketball, and there was always that kid that thought he was a superstar, but could not even hit the backboard with the ball. And we'd be, and he would always have an excuse, and he'd always say something. And can I tell you what he was? He was a joke. That's what he was. Now, if you know you're miserable, if you know you can't even hit the backboard with the ball, just enjoy it, man. Like, this is awesome. Because you know, and you have no expectation of being the superstar. What's the problem is when you are miserable and you have the expectation of being the superstar? And sometimes as believers, listen, the fact that we know our frailty, the fact that we know who we are, if that's the first step to humility. To God, I am exactly who you'd say I am. Amen. He will hear the humble. The second thing, this is a promise. Uh, he will answer. He will answer. Man, what a blessing. Now, sometimes his answer will be no. Sometimes his answer will be uh, wait. Sometimes his answer will be yes. But he will answer. Now, those two are connected. Is it possible for God to not hear your prayers? Well, the Bible says in Psalm 66, he that regardeth iniquity in his heart, the Lord will not hear him. And so if there's a lack of humility to deal with my sin when I go before God, I'm like the Pharisee that stood there and said, Lord, I thank thee as I'm not as other men. Listen, God heard the words coming out of his mouth, but God did not hear his prayer. Right. Where the publican said, Lord, uh, justify me, a sinner. Jesus said, which of them went away justified? Which of them went away heard? The one that was humble of heart. 
But praise the Lord, God will hear, God will answer. God will respond. And there needs to be a diligence to prayer and anticipation for the answer. Anticipation for the answer. Uh, one of the hardest things that, that they tell us in marriage is communication. And one of those reasons is because, man, we're built differently. Men and women are built differently. And one of the things that just drive my wife insane, honey, we're going to do some marriage counseling right here, me and you. Uh, drives our, my wife insane is when she asks me something and I just imply the answer inside my head because the answer is so obvious it doesn't have to come out of my mouth. And this awkward silence, and she's like, well, well, what? Of course. You know, and she, well, you know what she wants? She wants to hear the answer. There's an anticipation for, there used to be an anticipation for hearing the answer. She wants the response. And sometimes I think we pray just to hear ourselves speak. Friend, the whole reason for praying, dwelling, and fellowship with God is we should sit in anticipation for the answer. Isaiah chapter 40, they that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. The waiting on God is an exercise of faith and continuing to pray. But he hasn't answered yet. Praise the Lord, exercise on. Praise the Lord, exercise on. Waiting on the Lord is an exercise of faith that is actually going to renew my strength and then I'll be able to mount up with wings as eagles. Then I'll be able to run and not be weary. Then I'll be able to walk and not faint. Why? Because the wait is worth it. And the Lord says in, in um, Luke chapter number 18 and Luke chapter number 11, though I bear long with thee. Why would the Lord bear long with his response? Because the wait is worth it. The wait is worth it. It's interesting, we, we think about the waiting of men. There's a story in history of uh, Pope Innocent III. By the way, Pope Innocent III was not innocent of much, okay? But Pope Innocent III, uh, the, king, uh, uh, the king of France went to see him. I forgot his name all of a sudden, but the king of France went to see him, and the Pope made him wait for three days. For three days. And the reason that the king of France waited was because the Pope had the authority, of particularly of the weapon of the church interdiction against the nation. He knew if he left without an answer, he might go back to France, but his head was coming off. So he waits for three days. Why would the Pope make him wait? Because he wanted that king to know, you may be king of a nation, but I am appointed of God. Now, we disagree with his doctrine, Right? He is not actually appointed of God. But his point is, I want to display authority. But when you go and pray before the Lord, if the Lord makes you wait, he might say, you're king of your own life, but can I tell you who's God of the whole world? It's worth the wait. It's worth the wait. Anticipation. There's, a, there's an answer that will come. Not only that, uh, letter C, he will transform the request or you can add on there, the, the requester. <laughs> He'll transform the request or the one making the request. I just made up a word there. Make sure you mark it down. The requester. Okay. And the Bible says in Psalm 37 and verse number 4, He that delighteth himself in the Lord, the Lord shall give him the desires of his heart. Man, it's an incredible thing when my prayer begins to line up my heart with God's heart. You know what, often I found the reason that God has not responded to my prayer is because my prayer was of my will and his answer was of his will. And the waiting process was he was waiting for me to finally line up with him. And, and my prayer request changed or I changed. My prayer request became what he wanted or I became what he wanted and I could pray in such a different way. His, when we, the promise of prayer is he will transform the request or the one making the request. God will help us to see things that we never saw before. God will help us desire things that we never desired before. That's why God can say, he that delighteth himself in the Lord, he shall give him the desires of his heart. I'm going to say there's been some times in my life that if God gave me the desires of my heart, it would have been really bad. Why was that? Because at those times I was not delighting myself in the Lord. But when I delight myself in the Lord, my prayer request to him and myself even as the one praying 
it's transformed to line up in such a way that God says, I will give you exactly what you want. Because what you want is me. Paul says that I might know him and the power of his resurrection. And what an incredible thing. Think about some of the prayer requests of Paul. Paul prayed that the thorn in the flesh would be taken away from him. It wasn't. You know why? God wanted to transform Paul. He wanted to keep him humble before him. He says, my grace will be sufficient. He answered, didn't he? Not the answer that Paul was asking for, but even through the prayer, he wanted transformation. He wanted transformation. And Paul began to pray, and his heart was such that he began to desire, to, so much so that Paul prayed this, I'm betwixt two. Would it be better for me to be with you or to go to be with the Lord? And what an incredible thing to have such a heart to know him. That Paul could say, man, I, I don't even know. Ooh, I got this struggle. Right. I mean, here I am about to be put to death, and I have this struggle. To live on or to go to be with the Lord? But you know what? Even in that prayer request, he goes, but I know what is needful, what is beneficial for you. Mm -hmm. God transforms the requester. He transforms the request. Letter D there, he will give himself as the answer. He will give himself as the answer. Can I tell you, the Bible told us there in Psalm 16 that the Lord, the Lord is our portion. The Lord, he is our heritage. The greatest answer to a prayer request is the person of the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. You ever prayed for God help you to deal with something? Guess how he's going to help you deal with something? He will give you himself. You ever prayed that God will help you have victory over, over something or, or someone? You know how he's going to give you victory? He will give you of himself. Okay? The, the answer to prayer requests is the person of the Lord Jesus Christ. What solves all problems of the world is not a process but a person. Right. The Lord Jesus Christ. And he will, the Bible tells us in Luke chapter number 11, after all that prayer, guess what the Lord gives? The Lord gives the Holy Spirit. And a lot of times when we think about, when I think about Daniel, and I think about him going to his knees, and I'm asking myself, why is Daniel praying? What's the reason for, nobody even knows, nobody would even care. Nobody's keeping track, nobody's watching to see what he does. In fact, his life would probably be easier if he just, you know, followed the societal flow. And here's the conclusion I come with. Daniel needed his God. Amen. He wanted his God. So he'd open those windows towards Jerusalem, the place of God's presence in the Old Testament, where at that temple, who would be destroyed, it would be built again. But he opened the temple. He's like, man, that's, I want God's presence in my life. I want to pray because I want God's presence in my life. I want to be humble. I want to be contrite. I want him to give himself as an answer. Cleanse your hands, ye sinners. Draw nigh unto God, and he will draw nigh unto you. What I need as an answer of, to my prayer is the person of Jesus Christ. I need to have fellowship. Take your Bibles and turn to 1 John. Look what it says here in 1 John. We'll read it. It says, Probably one of my favorite passages of Scripture, 1 John. Look what it says in verse number 5. It says, This then is the message which we have heard unto him, and declare unto you that God is light, and in him is no darkness at all. If we say we have fellowship with him and walk in darkness, we lie and do not the truth. But if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship one with another, and the blood of Jesus Christ cleanses us from all sin. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sin, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all, in, all unrighteousness. If we say that we have no sin, we make him a liar, and the word is not in us. Chapter 2, my little children, these things write I unto you that ye sin not. And if any man sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. He is the propitiation for our sins, and not ours only, but also for the sins of the whole world. 
And whereby do we do know that we know him if we keep his commandment? He that saith, I know him, and keepeth not his commandment, he is a liar, and the truth is not in us. But whoso keepeth his word, and in him verily is the love of God perfect, and hereby we know that we are in him. If he saith, he abideth in him, he ought also to walk even as he walked. Now, you know what's interesting when you read that passage? Sometimes when we read it, we spend a lot of time discussing the walk and a lot of time discussing the, the dealing or confession of sin. Can I tell you, when you look at those in that passage, they're almost used synonymous. The walk is the dealing and confessing of sin and cleansing of sin. Guess where the walk happens? The walk happens in humbly coming before God, saying, God, you are light, in you is no darkness at all. I found darkness. I want fellowship with you. Please forgive me. I want to know you. The walk is the prayer. And the prayer is the walk. Now, if we would deem that, he says, he is who abides, and how do I abide in him? I abide in him by prayer. That, that walk will produce activity, but it begins with that humble fellowship with God, myself and him. There's a connection. You cannot walk in light unless your prayer is right. That's right. Because he that says he has no sin is a liar, and the truth is not in him. So what do I do with my sin? I have an advocate. How do I go before my advocate? I pray. I humble myself before God and ask him to cleanse me of all my sin. I do that in prayer. How do, I cannot walk in the light if my prayer before God is not right. They're not two distinguished things. I feel like I'm really walking with the Lord, but I need some work on my prayer life. <laughs> no, no, no. Your prayer life is the door that you walk through to walk in the light. That's the door. And so when we talk about our prayer, boy, we were talking this morning in Sunday school and somebody had brought up a, a statistic that they said they surveyed Christians and they said on average Christians sin 104 times a day. I'm like, how in the world did they get that? You know? Either there's some really, really honest people or it's a lot more than that. You know? But how much sin does it take to hinder our fellowship? Just a little darkness, right? God is light and in him is no darkness at all. Well, preacher, there's no way that I could walk without any darkness. If you sin, you have an advocate. You know how often I would need to be praying if I prayed every moment that I sin? Yeah, like praying without ceasing. Your prayer is your walk. And your walk is going to be determined by your prayer. And I'll tell you this, it's a lot harder, it's a lot more difficult to sin while you're talking to God. Yeah, it's a lot more difficult to sin amen. while you're talking to God. It's a lot more difficult to sin when you have your eyes on him and he has his eyes on you. Let me give you this illustration. I taught seventh grade math for years and I have 25 or 30 students in my seventh grade math class. And you'd be turned around, you'd be teaching, man, you'd have attention, eyes on you. Once I figured out how to do that, Okay, I figured and they weren't going crazy anymore. And, and I had attention, man. I would have them. I'd be watching them, teaching them, and then something would happen. I'd turn around to write on the board. As soon as I'd turn around to write on the board, something in my senses would tell me, I no longer got it. Something is messed up. And so I figured out, through watching uh, my wife when she would teach, because nobody ever said a word in her class, you know, I figured out that my wife would write on the board like this. Because she knew eye contact with everything. It's very difficult to do wrong when you're under eye contact. Sorry. Now, there was always those few. So the eye contact had to get a little bit more intense. But it's very difficult to do wrong. But as soon as you had lost eye contact, the teacher didn't have to go in the next room. The teacher didn't have to go out to lunch. You know what the teacher had to do? Lose eye contact. <laughs> right. And I thought, you know what? As a Christian, that's what I'm like. Man, when I see him and he sees me, Man, he's got me. I am just enamored by him. I love him. I want to obey him. But all I have to do is turn away from him. Just like that. And it's so easy. 
Yeah, but how do I restore fellowship? Just look back at his eyes and say, Lord, I'm, I'm guilty. Please forgive me. Help me. And my prayer determines my walk. And my walk is determined by my prayer. Might I have fellowship with him? Might I dwell with him through willingness to humbly pray to my God? Lord, I pray that you'd help us. Lord, might we be obedient to you. Lord, we know what our own struggles are. Lord, we, we think about um, the fact that most people would so quickly agree about the weakness of prayer in their life. Lord, but we learn from Daniel's example that we cannot blame it on circumstance. We cannot blame it on success or failure. We cannot blame it on uh, the people around us. Prayer is personal. Lord, and I pray that you'd help us to think of it not as a, a standing in line waiting to give a request, but dwelling in a high and holy place with a God who will dwell with the humble and contrite and will even revive the heart of the contrite so that as you reveal more of us to us, we can humbly confess our sin, humble, humble ourselves before you so that we might dwell with you, walk with you, abide with you, fellowship with you through prayer. Lord, I pray that you help us. In Jesus' name, amen. Stand together.